Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I would like to uh, give a talk on super hydrophobic coatings. And this will be an overview of the uh, important topic. And I uh, hope uh, you will glean and get uh, some very useful information here that you can apply to your uh, research. I am professor at Case Western Reserve uh, University and um, I'm part of the Macromolecular Science and Engineering Department. I'd also like to thank Park Systems for the opportunity to impart this knowledge uh, to the audience. So I'm located at uh, Case Western Reserve University, Cleveland, Ohio. We are at the fifth floor of the Kent Hale Smith Building. I am also director of PetroCase, which uh, focuses on the most important and uh, pressing materials problem for the oil and gas industry. Uh, I run a group of about five PhD students, several master's students, and undergrads. Uh, we do a lot of research related to interfaces, chemistry at um, colloidal and uh, substrate surfaces, employing nanomaterials, uh, nanostructured polymer materials, surface sensitive spectroscopic and microscopic techniques. Uh, we deal a lot with uh, surface modification, including molecular imprinting, polymer brushes, nanomaterials, colloidal patterning, and electro nano patterning. So today I'm going to uh, talk about super hydrophobic coatings as well as the importance of uh, uh, fabricating these surfaces in a variety of applications. As you can see here, uh, super hydrophobic coatings can have practical applications ranging from fabric protection to environmental um, extreme conditions where you have high uh, surface humidity, de-icing applications, transport of uh, fluids, uh, produce fluids like oil and gas, uh, different types of uh, cushion protection, marine, uh, anti-spill, anti-staining um, objectives, and even uh, and around it to the nth degree. Still is an interesting topic uh, to um, a variety of industries. So today, uh, this is the outline of Talk. We're going to talk uh, uh, in terms of we define super hydrophobic. Then we will look at a variety of methods for fabricating these surfaces, uh, some of the commercially available super hydrophobic coatings, and potential applications in different industries, including um, extraction, oil and gas, uh, um, production industries and water collectors. So what is super hydrophobicity? Well, the, the first thing we can uh, use to define it is in terms of the wetting uh, of the contact angle uh, value. Uh, first of all, uh, when we see or say something is super hydrophobic, the first thing that we think, of course, is that it does not wet the surface. And indeed, uh, this can be observed uh, in these pictures where uh, a droplet of water does not uh, um, spread on a surface, whether we're talking about a glass substrate or a, a leaf, as, as shown here. Uh, officially, when we say super hydrophobic uh, uh, contact angle, we are dealing with a value equal or greater than 150 degrees. And uh, sometimes we associate this with the self cleaning property or roll off angle, that means we can tilt that substrate um, uh, to less than 10 degrees and the droplet will just um, autonomically uh, roll off the surface. Now what you can see is that the surface of, 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 of the material plays a very important role uh, in this phenomena in that the structuring or nanostructuring or application of different hierarchical structuring methods uh, enable us to create this type of uh, um, wetting phenomena independent of the uh, surface energy. And I'll tell you a little more about that. 
uh, when I say surface energy, we are actually referring to the chemistry uh, that's present on the surface, and we normally associate this with uh, behavior in fluorinated or silicon um, modified uh, or even mercury modified uh, surfaces. Now, uh, this is observed a lot in nature uh, in that uh, it is a form of protective cooling or even water collecting mechanism in plants, insects, birds. Uh, as you can see here, uh, different types of uh, structures, uh, hierarchical structures of roughness, um, fibers, microfibrils, or texturing is present in many types of uh, surfaces, whether we're talking about the lotus leaf, butterfly, bird wings, water, insect water strider, and so on. And these are some of the uh, uh, SEM images that uh, uh, gives this uh, differentiation in uh, texture. So in many ways, the super hydrophobic property is associated with self-cleaning uh, in that uh, a lot of these uh, organisms, um, insects, mammals, or plants uh, rely on uh, droplets of water to recreate fresh uh, surfaces that is not um, out. Now, to give you a background in terms of quantification, we can start with the Young's equation, which is a measure of the surface energy uh, and wettability between uh, air, water, and liquid. So in this case, the surface tension uh, defines the Young's equation in that the uh, a surface tension or free energy between that of um, solid and air uh, is equal to the interface or the uh, surface energy between solid and liquid and liquid and air and defined by a cosine theta. So the contact angle here, as shown here uh, in this picture, is essentially a um, angle defined by the droplet of water on the solid substrate. And it's usually measured with a goniometer uh, or a contact angle goniometer and recorded as an image or dynamically measured in terms of um, Tilt, uh, both static and dynamic type of measurements. So in this case, if water is used as a liquid, then a surface that wets it uh, will have a contact angle of less than 90, approaching zero to that of super wetting or super hydrophilic surfaces. On the other hand, a uh, contact angle greater than 90 is defined as hydrophobic. Uh, and, and that means that the droplet of water starts to be that. Uh, on the other hand, the term superhydrophobic, as we uh, showed you earlier, will achieve a value of about 150. So Young's equation is the basic uh, uh, phenomena that um, spells wetting on an ideal flat surface and controlled um, atmospheric environment uh, We know that uh, surfaces are not uh, perfect. Uh, in a uh, surface that is uh, homo not necessarily homogeneous uh, morphologically uh, or what we call rough, uh, what happens is the liquid uh, essentially wets the surface, but then the roughness of the surface uh, results in a factor that uh, essentially corrects the um, Young's equation. So this surface roughness uh, is defined by a, uh, uh, the R value, the ratio of the actual to the apparent surface area of the substrate. And then the apparent contact angle on a textured surface is simply R times the cosine theta of what you would have measured using an ideal flat surface. So the basic assumption here in a Wenzel um, phenomena is that the liquid follows the roughness of the surface but uh, essentially the liquid totally wets the rough surface. So this value can be 1 or a value of R greater than 1 and that means you account for that uh, roughness 
um, contribution. Uh, on the other hand, what can possibly happen is that as the liquid wets the surface, uh, not all of the uh, rough surface will be totally wet. In other words, uh, there's a case that air will be trapped uh, on this uh, rough um, morphology or uh, uh, texture, and uh, one needs to account then for the trapped air contribution in terms of a correction on the um, material uh, uh, itself. So in this case, uh, you can represent this in terms of a fraction of the solid liquid contact uh, and it's governed by the CASI model or equation as shown um, here. Now in summary, what we are dealing essentially is a modification of the Young's equation uh, as shown in this um, diagram and experimentally one determines this as a cosine theta of the uh, wetting angle that is observed um, using a contact angle goniometer. So as you can see with this modified equation, the Wenzel phenomena corrects for the actual surface and a geometric surface ratio and hence the correction factor R. On the other hand, the cassie baxter phenomena accounts for the interfacial area of the porous microstructure times cosine theta minus the interfacial area of the air in the interspaces among the porous microstructure. So um, the cassie baxter equations, equation is in fact uh, quite useful in quantifying the um, property observed with most superhydrophobic surfaces. Now, we talk about superhydrophobic, but uh, let us not forget there's also such a thing as superoleophobic. Uh, uh, superoleophobic uh, means that it hates oil, uh, whereas superhydrophobic means it hates water. Uh, hating oil has some practical applications, as you can see here, uh, in that it is good for creating smudge-free surfaces or areas where you have uh, more organic and oil environment that can cause problems on uh, surfaces. Uh, in fact, if you combine super oleophobic and super hydrophobic on any surface, we have a term for that. It's called omniphobic surfaces. It hates all surfaces. And uh, one can say even that that is an ideal situation uh, for coatings that are meant to be a barrier property uh, in, in all cases or transport. Uh, in that uh, if you have an omniphobic surface, you basically will solve many fouling problems, uh, whether uh, in bio implants or even in transport uh, uh, phenomena. So now we'll go to different ways of fabricating superhydrophobic surfaces. And we've outlined here about uh, uh, yeah, 11 um, possible methods, uh, uh, 10 possible methods uh, to prepare these surfaces and uh, we will go over them one by one. Uh, and there, there should be more uh, and this will be representative of some that has been uh, reported in literature. Again, we will deal, deal here first with uh, uh, super hydrophobic uh, surfaces. So one of the methods that uh, is, is done or we have done in fact is used utilizing electrochemical deposition. So in summary are recreated uh, or can be uh, fashioned in a way that they produce what we call hierarchical roughness. That is, if one is able to achieve uh, durable uh, surfaces that results in uh, roughness scales from nanometers to microns to hundreds of microns uh, um, or achieving uh, valleys, hills, mountains to that of sh shrubs, trees. I'm just giving you an example here of uh, what we might try to uh, uh, give as an analogy in what we observe. In that these are really large scale uh, different roughness uh, textures. And being able to do this micro nano structuring is actually the key 
to all of these methods for achieving super hydrophobicity. Materials. So um, this example, uh, first example we have, is basically creating a, a rock surface based on anodization methods uh, utilizing zinc oxide nanostructures and then uh, mixed with uh, HF and methanol uh, to achieve these different types of textures. Uh, in this case, uh, this will either result in formation of dots, nanowires, nanoflowers, uh, essentially by controlling the concentration of the electrolyte and reacting type. And um, in principle, any uh, metal oxide or even conducting polymer, as I'll show uh, later, uh, if it is able to achieve this type of texture, will eventually give you that Cassie-Baxter approach in a super hydrophobic effect. Uh, another method makes use of uh, polymers that can be uh, produced by electrospinning. Electrospinning is a method by which uh, in the presence of a high voltage field, a solution uh, or even melt type of material is discharged on a, a syringe or spinneret and that high voltage results in the formation of a very thin nanometer to sub micron diameter fibers or wires. Uh, and so if this material is, uh, is, is spun on a surface, essentially a non-woven um, material um, that is deposited on a flat surface, what happens is again you create that roughness that results in a super hydrophobic effect. And uh, in this case, uh, the examples are shown. Uh, reports values of contact angles anywhere between 155 and 151 and uh, using a solution between 9 to 1 to 12 weight percent of um, the material. In fact, uh, a common way to improve the property of such materials is to actually um, add some um, fluorinated material either by uh, silane um, modification or uh, evaporation of uh, uh, fluorinated uh, uh, monomers. Uh, in this case, uh, the fluorination actually improves not only the superhydrophobic effect, but perhaps the self-cleaning uh, property as well. So this is an example where an electrospan fiber was able to achieve a superhydrophobic effect. Uh, another method in, in involves that of uh, preparing a rough structure on a copper wafer uh, utilizing an acid etching technique with uh, the use of a surfactant and an ultrasonification method. So uh, in this case, after modifying with a, uh, again, a perfluorinated silane, the copper wire uh, showed uh, stable hydrophobicity. Uh, shown here are SEM images of the uh, hundreds of micron scale showing the uh, spherical micropeats that are created when etched with the acid and CPAP. Yet another method is based on hydrothermal synthesis. Uh, in this case, the nanomaterials are uh, deposited on the surface based on a tungsten oxide uh, um, a nanostructured film uh, that is prepared on an alumina plate a surface. So in this case, the metal oxide uh, uh, is deposited on the surface followed by um, um, absorption-desorption of uh, n dodecan tile with silver deposits on this structure. The result is you end up with a, a substrate that again has a super hydrophobic effect. Uh, in this case, uh, they've actually, uh, if you look at the original paper, uh, they were able to demonstrate reverse wettability uh, between super uh, hydrophobic and a super hydrophilic environment by controlling uh, that um, process with uh, the decking tile. Uh, here we have um, styrene and hexafluorobutyl metacrylate copolymers uh, that is uh, made first by bulk copolymerization. And then these were prepared uh, and deposited in THF. 
And then finally, uh, with an ethanol solution uh, and because of phase separation, they resulted in microstructures as a film having a degree of uh, roughness based on phase separation resulting in a super hydrophobic effect. So this is a polymer uh, film that was prepared uh, resulting in phase separation and uh, nanostructuring to create that super hydrophobic film. Um, one can take a fabric, a uh, cheesecloth or a cotton uh, woven fiber or even non-woven fiber and render it super hydrophobic utilizing what we call the electrostatic layer by layer approach. Uh, in this case, uh, one can take this material and then deposit silica nanoparticles on a fiber. Uh, the silica uh, is deposited using a layer um, by layer deposition method. And then a final treatment of this material actually involves a fluoroalkyl silane treatment and that's resulting in a non-wetting coating on the cotton fabric. Now, you notice that in uh, a number of these cases we've covered so far that uh, a, a fluorine um, or the use of fluoroalkylsilane treatment was employed uh, to achieve a super hydrophobic effect. Now, that is not necessarily the case for all of these coatings. And as you'll see some examples here, uh, they don't even apply any uh, of the silane treatment and yet achieve uh, a super hydrophobic effect. So in this case, uh, this is one of the uh, uh, examples where we did not employ a super, uh, high, I mean a fluorinated material that in order to achieve a super hydrophobic effect. So what we have here, and I, I re, we've reported this, this is our own work that we've reported in uh, um, literature about four years ago, in that we can deposit polythiophene uh, on um, textured surfaces uh, using electrochemical deposition methods. And these are just uh, the proof that the uh, polymer was electropolymerized on a um, ITO or gold surface uh, that's textured with uh, colloidal um, polystyrene spheres. So the polythiophene, as you can see here, the chemical structure is, uh, of course, neither fluorinated nor uh, containing any siloxane group. It's a polythiophene with an ester or a polythiophene uh, with an acid group. And so we formed these films and uh, let's focus on the SEM uh, image which shows the hierarchical roughness, again, that's common on a, a number of the films that we've uh, shown you so far, and FDR imaging confirming the presence of the polythiophene and even the polystyrene um, um, spheres uh, underneath. Uh, we achieve a super hydrophobic uh, status. So in this case, upon depositing or electrodepositing this with uh, polystyrene textured uh, surfaces of about 500 uh, nanometer diameter, we were able to achieve super hydrophobic effect uh, with the polythiophene uh, that does not contain any uh, fluorinated group. In fact, what's interesting here, and uh, we've shown this in uh, previous uh, webinars, that this not only has a super hydrophobic property, it also has a super a lipophilic property. In other words, it hates water, but it loves oil. Uh, and we know this because the contact angle is zero. In other words, when we drop uh, uh, oil, uh, uh, we, we've tried it with uh, hexane, uh, toluene, and kerosene, it just soaks it and um, that does not show any uh, wetting behavior. It's zero contact angle. Now, uh, we've actually used the same method to modify carbon steel. And as shown here, uh, the rationale was to coat it or use it as a coating to protect steel from not only wetting but corrosion. Uh, so we take carbon, we took carbon steel, we coated it with the polystyrene spheres as shown here in a uh, deposition method uh, uh, where the colloidal spheres forms a, a two-dimensional array on the surface. Uh, the result is we can get um, 
uh, wetting behavior of about 152, so greater than 150 uh, contact angles, signifying a super hydrophobic effect. And this is shown uh, both in the contact angle and in the uh, visual uh, microgram. Now, um, Uh, and, and going back to this, if you are actually able to uh, go to the original paper, uh, one of the things we demonstrated here is that by converting this to a super hydrophobic surface, we are also able to make it into a, a very good anti-corrosion coating. Uh, here we have a uh, method for creating this surface roughness based on the deposition of uh, uh, crystals uh, on a surface. Uh, the copper uh, uh, oxide, copper hydroxide nitrate crystal that was then modified with a perfluorosilane. Again, uh, what we are seeing here is by creating this hierarchy of roughness and combining it with a surface modification, one is able to uh, achieve a super hydrophobic method, a super hydrophobic property using this method. Uh, here is another example, a sol gel type of uh, modification. Uh, the superhydrophobicity was achieved and not only superhydrophobicity but a good transparency or high transmission coating was achieved. And this is important for optical or uh, even uh, display applications where we want to retain the transparency and at the same time the uh, superhydrophobic behavior. So in this case, the uh, silica colloidal particles uh, were aggregated and dispersed uh, on the uh, surface with the aid of uh, an aminopropyl triethoxysilane treatment. And this aggregates uh, consequently formed that rough surface which then resulted in a superhydrophobic effect. And because of the refractive index match, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure going to this original paper, it also showed a um, uh, anti-reflection property. A uh, superhydrophobic effect was achieved on a sol gel film deposited on glass. Uh, here is a spray coating or casting method uh, involving the use of a carbon nanotube functionalized uh, uh, film. And this was deposited on the surface as shown here with a roughness by SEM. And a super hydrophobicity was achieved, uh, even showing a contact angle of about 160 degrees and a slight angle less than 3, indicating that these are self-cleaning surfaces. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that uh, uh, light transmission or transparency was achieved, as shown by the uh, graph here on the transmittance uh, towards visible to near IR wavelength. All right, so uh, one may question, well, can we do this any easier? Or can we have our own uh, super hydrophobic coating without using all those treatments? Well, fortunately, uh, some companies are trying to make you uh, buy their product uh, to achieve this property. Uh, if you go to your local, uh, I believe, Home Depot, uh, you will be able to buy this Rustoleum Never Wet uh, product. It's a two-part uh, uh, coating, and I believe uh, this company is trying to come up with a one-part spray, but the two-part coating uh, first enables you to modify a surface with a sort of primer uh, such that the application of your step two or top coat will result in that uh, super uh, hydrophobic effect. Uh, I, I cannot say uh, the composition or any type of reverse engineering work on this prestoleum because of obviously uh, it's proprietary. Uh, but what you can imagine is that the self-cleaning uh, behavior can be achieved uh, essentially by a super hydrophobic surface which can be based on texturing or, or the texturing plus surface modification with a fluorinated or a uh, sil silane based uh, modification method to achieve this uh, type of self-cleaning uh, material. Not only is uh, they claim it to be self-cleaning, but it's also an anti-corrosion coating, anti-icing, and anti-wetting uh, material. So as I said, this is commercially available, and you can try it out. 
Uh, another company that uh, uh, has a super hydrophobic coatings. And by the way, uh, you can of course look at a, a number of other companies, startup companies that have their own commercial methods for creating these surfaces or um, uh, chemical treatment. Um, so this company, uh, they have a product called Hydrobead, and uh, not only does it achieve uh, super hydrophobic coatings for non-wetting environment, but uh, they also show that it results in uh, ice uh, de-icing and even antimicrobial properties, which leads us to uh, ask, you know, what are the practical applications of a super hydrophobic coating other than non-wetting? Um, here, another company, uh, Lotus Leaf Coatings, uh, has a product called uh, Hydrofo, and uh, they demonstrate that this product has superior water, water repellency, uh, but also uh, it's uh, optically clear. In other words, uh, they, they boast that the coating enables uh, high transmission rates, and um, they're UV stable. Um, patternable and uh, to a number of coating methods they can apply uh, this material. Actually a very important question you may ask is, well if we achieve the super hydrophobic coating, how long does it last? And that is the perennial question in all of these methods. Uh, yes, I achieved the super hydrophobic coating in a clean environment, but if I start applying it in an actual environment or a turbulent flow environment or expose it to the atmosphere for a long time or oxidizing atmosphere, will it last? So that's the important question one needs to ask with these materials. How long do they last? Are they durable? Are they resistant with abrasion? Uh, is the initial fouling going to prevent them from functioning ever? Uh, is there a way that I can regenerate this surface uh, with a simple uh, treatment or uh, a washing. So those are important questions when it comes to uh, some of the possible commercial applications of these coatings. So as you can see here, uh, this is from this review, that a super hydrophobic uh, surface has many applications when it comes to um, uh, de-icing or uh, friction reduction or uh, improved heat transfer, self-cleaning, uh, preventing corrosion. And, and so we are going to uh, have a sampling of these possible applications. So you can see that uh, if uh, super hydrophobic coating is very durable, easily applied in a number of uh, process industries, transport, uh, even military application, it can save a lot of fouling or energy. Uh, mitigating corrosion or even safety in terms of uh, transport uh, um, value chain. So uh, first looking at the oil and gas industry, is there an interest uh, for anti-corrosion in oil and gas industry? Of course, uh, it is a big problem uh, not only dealing with uh, surface structures, downhole, casings, but also transportation of oil and gas. Uh, transportation in pipes uh, is by far the biggest way to transport this produced fluid, and we're talking about thousands of miles, thousands of miles in the United States alone so that crisscrosses the continent. So in many ways, uh, preventing corrosion on carbon steel uh, by the application of a protective coating or the use of a super hydrophobic coating to prevent fouling is a very important proposition. So as you can see here pictorially, if one can prepare a roughness, uh, let's say with a hydrophobic nanostructure that in fact uh, is able to trap air as in the Cassie-Baxter approach, in the presence of brine or produced fluid, uh, it can prevent corrosion. In anti-icing application, the question is, uh, can a condensed water droplet uh, eventually ice a surface or uh, the prevention uh, in a, a cold climate or cryogenic sur surface will it prevent formation of ice crystals? So the uh, proposition is that if you want 
if you do not want ice or ice crystals to form, then the first thing you need to do is to prevent water uh, from water droplets from forming at, at the surface or nucleating ice formation in the surface. And, and so a variety of schemes by which essentially they prevent icing or de-icing or preventing adhesion of ice on surface is basically creating that super hydrophobic effect. And that means that any type of uh, heat uh, transfer or even as a protective uh, insulating material. Remember, air is the best insulator uh, in, in many practical applications. So perhaps uh, are, are the trapped air in super hydrophobic surfaces a form of insulation, or they contribute mostly to the super hydrophobic effect through the Cassie Baxter phenomenon. So there are a number of uh, mechanisms that are used to explain. Nevertheless, in most cases where they have a super hydrophobic coating, they have also observed a de-icing or poor ice adhesion on a uh, super hydrophobic uh, material. So as you can see here, the ice adhesion strength decreases as you increase the contact angle of the material or you achieve a super hydrophobic effect as shown in this uh, plot. Okay, so a super hydrophobic surface uh, will only have half uh, the adhesion strength as compared to a bare aluminum surface, and this was proven in a number of cycles, or up to 15 icing and de-icing cycles. Uh, another uh, experiment shown here is that if you have super cool water, minus 20 degrees uh, C, that was put on a plate, uh, differentiating that of a untreated, non-super uh, hydrophobic surface, and a nanoparticle polymer composite, uh, displaying a super hydrophobic surface. You can instantly see that the ice crystals form or are easily adhered on an untreated aluminum plate, whereas the super hydrophobic surface uh, have a very poor adhesion on the super cooled water. And the morphology of that surface treatment uh, as shown in, is shown in the SEM diagram below. Uh, another uh, icing application uh, in this case, uh, exposing it directly to the environment shows the um, um, untreated surface of aluminum totally covered with ice. Um, on the other hand, uh, a surface that is uh, coated with a super hydrophobic composition uh, have uh, little ice or uh, maybe one of the easiest things can do, one can do is a simple um, shaking or mechanical shaking can easily remove any ice that tends to adhere on the surface. So again, the same uh, uh, phenomena is in effect. Uh, in this case, it's a surface treatment made up of a polymer binder and a hydrophobic particle as shown here, preventing freezing rain from uh, accumulating or depositing ice on a surface. Um, other applications, can superhydrophobic surfaces use for friction reduction. Uh, so this simple table says yes, um, uh, the uh, super hydrophobic surface can be treated on a hydrofoil, a channel, a plate, and uh, if you have uh, a type of flow, whether it's laminar flow, turbulent flow, the super hydrophobic surface is able to reduce it up to 75%. In other words, uh, super hydrophobic uh, uh, surfaces tend to control the flow behavior in a positive or synergistic way. And one of the biggest advantages of this is that you have savings in terms of the energy or the pressure needed to push a liquid uh, through these channels. So friction reduction uh, is observed and uh, this is another way to express it in terms of the change in velocity with the channel depth. Uh, what this shows you is that the slip velocity at the air liquid interface, um, you can have uh, up to 60% savings uh, in terms of that velocity. In other words, the, the fluid will go faster in a super hydrophobic surface when uh, it is there. Uh, here uh, you can see how the drag uh, uh, can be used as a uh, measure of the flow of gas. Uh, the frictional drag here 
uh, is um, expressed in terms of the gas fraction and depending on the uh, surface one can experience uh, a drug reduction on or the fraction of gas based on a, a super hydrophobic modified uh, channel. Uh, here is another expression based on the Reynolds number of the shear stress differentiating that of a super hydrophobic surface. So the wall shear stress of the flow over a super hydrophobic surface results in a drug reduction uh, showing that uh, in a liquid flow one can achieve a, a lower Reynolds number uh, with introduction of a super hydrophobic effect. Uh, boiling heat transfer and the super hydrophobic surface. So in this case uh, you have heat exchange or the generation of uh, let's say a, a high uh, temperature or heating device uh, where one can calculate the heat transfer coefficient uh, and compare that with a normal surface. So in this case uh, there are many types of applications and notably heat exchangers where we want to use a super hydrophobic surface and demonstrate uh, energy savings or efficiency in uh, terms of heat transfer. So as can be shown here a super hydrophilic surface, a hydrophilic, hydrophobic and a super hydrophobic surface so the easiest comparison here is that with a super hydrophilic surface, you have little nucleation or uh, bubble, bubble of formation, uh, which uh, would uh, be an indicative of boiling. On the other hand, for the super hydrophobic surface, uh, uh, so the hydrophobic surface clearly is superior to the super hydrophilic and hydrophilic surface in terms of the uh, um, nucleation of bubbles. On the other hand, uh, with a super hydrophobic surface, it's so efficient that you don't uh, even see bubbling, but rather the bubbles coalesce into a film of air or a layer of air uh, that forms on the surface, um, at, uh, even at a temperature of 210 uh, degrees. So uh, this can perhaps be expressed better in this graph in that uh, the number of nucleation and the temperature required to achieve that with a super hydrophobic surface is better as compared to a hydrophilic surface. Uh, and so the nucleation or the number of nucleation sites on a super hydrophobic surface is far, far larger compared to a hydrophobic, hydrophilic and a super hydrophilic uh, um, coating or um, surface. Uh, another uh, of application as, as shown here is in terms of uh, condens condensing or water collection. So what you have here is um, copper pipes in which you have bare copper which we will assume to be hydrophilic, a copper pipe that is made hydrophobic and a super hydrophobic copper pipe. So the objective here is essentially to use the copper pipe as a condenser or uh, 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 water or in a high humidity um, component. So in this case bare copper, the water wets the surface. That means the water is retained in the surface and blocks the uh, condense, uh, condensation of water. A hydrophobic surface will form droplets which will eventually coalesce to form bigger droplets and then drop on the uh, a container or collector. On the other hand, a super hydrophobic surface nucleates uh, uh, essentially uh, is, is so efficient uh, that uh, you don't see any droplets uh, here at all. So film-wise, drop-wise, uh, as soon as it uh, hits the surface, it drops uh, to the container. So a super hydrophobic surface is a very efficient water collector or uh, used for condensa condensing um, uh, water vapor to uh, liquid. This is uh, can, ex can be explained uh, somewhat by this textured surface in that if you have a uh, surface that is um, uh, textured, uh, let's say in an ideal uh, uh, design where you have pillars uh, that eventually collects those small droplets and then it drains um, 
uh, through the uh, pillars. These big droplets form large droplets on the pillars and then finally uh, they are condensed. In a superhydrophobic surface, this results in a Wenzel state. And uh, that means that uh, surfaces can be uh, made very efficient uh, to control the nucleation site of droplets. And so uh, this is easily achieved by um, this phenomena or Wenzel phenomena. Uh, now I'll be finishing with this last application. Uh, this is essentially the use of a polybenzoxazine coating that we prepared um, on uh, uh, carbon steel as shown here. These are very durable coatings that we've been testing for uh, high pressure and high temperature condition. And uh, polybenzoxazine is a type of uh, a thermoset, you know, just like epoxies or polyurethane, very durable. But in this case, we were able to achieve a uh, super hydrophobic phenomena with these films. As shown uh, in this uh, view graph, the super hydrophobicity was achieved in a particular composition, PRS50. And these films are very strongly adhered on carbon steel as we tested it with the ASTM method uh, D3359. Uh, and also quite stable at a variety of uh, pH conditions. Uh, the AFM micrograph shows the texture of the polybenzoxazine uh, composition on the surface. Uh, so these are very durable films, super hydrophobic, and uh, we we have uh, um, uh, we are finishing this publication. Uh, well, some of the promising properties include uh, very good anti-corrosion properties as well. Uh, in fact, when we coated this with a wire mesh, um, uh, it also showed a very good oil and water separation. Uh, before I do that, uh, just showing you the optical micrograph and the SEM image of the films uh, after immersion uh, with seven days. You can see very little deposited uh, material uh, on PR and almost none on PR. Uh, to S50 composition, whereas your bare steel is completely fouled. So when we look at that before and after immersion, basically no corrodent uh, is deposit, deposited on the um, uh, PRS2 to S50 composition of polybenzoxazine. Uh, so these are very durable coatings. And uh, in fact, when we deposited them on a wire mesh, um, uh, they, they adhere very well here. Uh, you can see the EIS and the polarization tactile plots measurement showing that the super hydrophobic properties also achieve very good anti-corrosion properties. So by EIS and polarization measurements, we can get efficiencies up to 99% and uh, up to 80% after uh, four days of immersion in uh, the corrodent liquid. And we believe the composition we have uh, created a tortuous path for the um, corrodent or corrosive medium, uh, preventing it from penetrating all the way to carbon steel. So the last application uh, we have here is essentially the polybenzoxazine coating on a wire mesh. And uh, when we try to add uh, gasoline, diesel, hexane, petroleum, uh, it went through the wire mesh. In other words, uh, it loves oil. And uh, with gravity or minimum intrusion pressure, we can differentiate it between different types of liquid. Uh, so as shown here in the picture, if we stain uh, the gasoline or diesel with a red dye, it goes through the wire mesh. However, when we stained water uh, with a blue color, uh, it uh, does not go through the wire mesh. So it just stays uh, on top of the wire mesh. However, when we mix the two, only the oil goes through, whereas the water composition stays on top of the wire mesh. So what this is, is it's a very efficient oil and water separator that can be achieved using gravity-based uh, intrusion pressure. So uh, believe it or not, uh, this is the uh, last slide uh, that I'm showing you. Hopefully this is, has given you a uh, overview of the superhydrophobic phenomena, the way to make it, methods, 
commercially available uh, uh, materials out there uh, and also some of the possible applications and uh, uh, challenges to make it a durable coating applied to uh, many industries. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and, and joining us. Uh, and unfortunately, um, this is a pre-recorded um, uh, webinar, but I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have, and you may contact me by email at rca41 at case.edu. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to give the uh, uh, floor back to Gerald.